بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Then again the same. 
Uh, at that time, we expect our Muslim place to depart for prayer, which would only, we expect would only take about five minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the people who remain will have the opportunity to stretch and, uh, and to write down their questions. Uh, and after that, uh, there will be a short closing statement. No, there, there will be a time for questions. We shall call every person to ask the question. The topic is very important. Uh, and the questions and the discussions are to be strictly on this topic alone. And this, this, that is, according to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, did Jesus himself claim to be God? Am I right? Fine. Uh, with this introduction, I would like Paul to start uh, his discussion. Well, it is a privilege to be with you here tonight. Abu and I have been planning this for quite some time, and I am grateful for the chance to stand before you regarding this very special topic. Let me thank the leaders of the Dutch Reformed Church for allowing us to meet in this beautiful hall, as well as the IPCI for their part in the debate as well. My opponent tonight is a friend. We have eaten together on a number of occasions, and each time our conversation turns to the differences between our religious convictions. Abu is a man of intelligence, and that is not under debate tonight. It is my goal during this event to exhibit an attitude of mutual respect, but not an attitude of compromise. What is under debate tonight is the radically different ways by which we view Jesus Christ. We are not debating the rights of women, posture and prayer, food laws, or even Jesus' claims about himself within the Quran. For sake of time and clarity, Abu and I have narrowed this debate to what Jesus claimed about himself within the pages of the New Testament Gospels. Some of you may have been to Abu's lectures a couple of years ago on the topic, Jesus Christ in Islam. In those lectures, Abu was not afraid to interact with the Bible. He held the scriptures in his hands and he quoted from them often. On that night, he was not merely arguing that Jesus denied deity from the Quran. That much is obvious. Rather, he argued that within this Christian scriptures themselves, Jesus never claimed to be God. And this is the challenge for the Christian tonight. Now to ask for examples from the Bible where there are claims of Jesus to be God is like asking a sailor if he is able to find fish in the sea. How, how would he merely go about it? He didn't know. In the same way, it is not difficult for Christians to find Jesus' claims to deity not only in the Bible or even the New Testament, or even in the Gospels themselves, even in a single book. Christians have enough evidence for the deity of Christ where we could find a host of examples from just a single chapter of the book of John alone. Now many of you here may be wondering, why is this debate from the Bible? The Quran has, the Islam has their holy book, the Quran, and Christians have their holy book, the Bible, and never the two shall meet. But we must understand that the Quran itself tells Muhammad to refer to the Gospels for guidance. Surah 5, 46 and 47. We sent him, that is Jesus, the Gospel. Therein was guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him a guidance and an admonition to those who fear Allah. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. Apparently Muhammad thought that the teachings of Jesus within the gospels 
would support what he was saying in the Quran. Some Muslims simply take the Bible and say that it is corrupt and simply move on. Other Muslims, like Abu tonight, chooses instead to take these words of the Quran seriously and to go to the scriptures themselves for guidance. Now before I give some proofs for the deity of Christ within the Gospels, allow me to define briefly the nature of Jesus within the Trinity. And this is important for us tonight because many people understand this doctrine. Perhaps this misunderstanding stems from Surah 5, 116. O Jesus, Son of Mary, didst thou say unto men, Worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of Allah? So let me define the Trinity in 14 words. These are simple enough for my little children to memorize and probably easy enough for us to memorize as well. Here is the definition of the Trinity. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. There is only one God. Now perhaps this illustration up here will help us. And that is there are three persons, and all of these persons are of one divine essence, but yet separate persons. So for example, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. Long before Muhammad received his revelation from the angel in the seventh century, Christians have promoted monotheism. Exodus 6 verse 4 is a Bible verse. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh, Eloheinu Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. We hear the same words from the mouth of Jesus in Mark 10, 29, and the mouth of Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 5. Christians are monotheists. We believe in one God. Christians believe that Jesus has always existed in his divine nature, though at a moment in time came into the world, took on human flesh, human nature, in addition to his divine nature, and yet lived a holy life without sin. Therefore, it is not surprising for us to look within the pages of Scripture and find that Jesus is tired, or thirsty, or even died. For these are all synonymous things with human nature. And this definition, of course, will protect us from objections from passages like John 17, where Jesus prays to the Father, and the objection goes something like this. There is only one God, how could Jesus pray to the Father? And of course, this argument and this passage only strengthens our confidence in the deity of Christ and in the Trinity. Jesus prayed to the Father because they are separate persons, but of the same essence. Make no mistake, tonight, this is not a minor difference between Muslims and Christians. Abu is fond of saying that he too is a follower of Jesus, that he too loves Jesus, and we no doubt will hear that tonight. And yet neither Muslims or anyone else who worships, anyone else that worships the true God, if they reject Jesus as he truly is in the Gospels, they do not worship the true God. Jesus said in Luke 10, 16, the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Or John 5, 23, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. There is no middle ground with Jesus. There is no learner's permit when it comes to the theology of Jesus Christ being God. You are either with him all the way or you are against him. John 12, 30, whoever is not with me is against me. We cannot say, well, I believe in Jesus, I just do not believe that he is God. 
You take the whole package or you take nothing. Now let me address one more objection before we dive into Jesus' claims of deity. Many Muslims will ask, why does Jesus never say, I am God, worship me, those exact words? And it is true, in fact, those exact words are not found within the pages of Scripture. But I would like to argue tonight that Jesus' claims to deity through his attributes and through his teachings and through what he proclaimed about himself in all that he was are much stronger and clearer than if he had merely said, I am God, worship me, full stop. If Jesus had simply arrived on the scene and said, hello folks, I'm God, this certainly would have confused people who did not have, at that time, a full understanding of the Trinity. And so, Jesus Christ, when he claimed to be God, people would ask, is he claiming to be another God, a second God, a third God, some kind of competing deity? And so Jesus took 33 years on earth to clarify what he was saying. And thus, with that foundation laid this evening, allow me to give four ways that Jesus claimed to be God within the Gospels. First, Jesus claims deity in his titles. Jesus uses a number of titles for himself that point to his deity. He is called Emmanuel which means God with us. He calls himself the Son of God and the Son of Man, both of these titles referring to his deity. The Old Testament uses many names for God, beginning and the end, Lord, Savior, King, Judge, Light, Rock, Redeemer, Shepherd, Creator, Giver of Life, Forgiver of Sin, all of these titles are used of Jesus in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the most sacred, personal, covenant name of God is Yahweh, or Jehovah. And only the true God, and the true God alone, will ever take this name for himself. And for a human to take this name for himself, would be blasphemy. And let listen to these words in Isaiah 41 verse 4. It says, I, the Lord, that is Yahweh, Jehovah, the first and with the last, I am He. In the Greek, that is ego eimi. That is important. That is a claim for himself. I am. He defines himself as ego in me. Or Isaiah 43, 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand ego in me. I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Now, ironically, this is a passage that is used by Jehovah's Witnesses to take their name. And yet Jehovah's Witnesses, along with Muslims, deny vigorously the deity of Christ. And yet this passage is one of the strongest proofs in the Old Testament for the deity of Christ. Why? Why is that? Because when we come to the New Testament, and the soldiers and the religious leaders are looking for Jesus, and they say, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, Ego in me. I am. And when Jesus said those words, my friends, when he said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And when we come to John 8, 58, and Jesus again uses this very title for himself, where he says, before Abraham was, Ego in me. I am. 
If he had merely wanted to show that he existed before Abraham, which in itself would be enough to prove the deity of Christ, he could have said, before Abraham was, I was. That's not what Jesus said. In fact, what Jesus said were these words, before Abraham was, I am ego eimi. He identified himself as only Yahweh does. The enemies of Jesus knew what he was saying, and so the Bible says in chapter 8 and verse 59 that they picked up stones to throw at him. Number two, Jesus claims deity in his actions. Jesus forgave sins. Now in Matthew 9, 6, Jesus said, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And you may say, this is no proof of deity at all, for you and I forgive each other all the time. This is what we teach our children to do. And yet Jesus took this a step further. For he forgave the sins done against God. In Matthew 9, 2, we find a story of a paralytic who had done no offense to Jesus. And yet Jesus says to him, My son, your sins are forgiven. We as humans may forgive those offenses done against ourselves, but Jesus forgave sins done against God, something creatures cannot do. Jesus heard and answered prayer. Jesus said to his followers, when you pray, address your prayers to me by praying in my name. John 14, 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Think of all the languages and the millions of prayers that go up to Jesus every hour. Only God could make such a claim. Jesus received adoration and praise. In John 9, 38, the blind man believed in Jesus and worshipped him. The word for worship there literally means to prostrate oneself. And this is exactly what Muslims do before Allah. But when a man did this before Jesus, he accepted it. Perhaps the greatest example is Jesus accepting Thomas's claim of deity in John 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God. And for those of you who are tsongas here uh, tonight, the Shangan is even clearer. Tomasi Akupayena, Hosi Yanga, Shikwembu Shanga. There is no dramatical escape from the veracity of this claim by Thomas. Contrast this with other stories of this in the scriptures when Jesus' followers, like the apostles in Acts 14, were hailed as gods and they tore their clothes and saying, We are only men like you. Jesus did no such thing. Jesus is the object of men's faith. In John 14, 1, Jesus places himself on the same level as the Father and as the proper object of men's trust. Jesus said these words, Believe in God, believe also in me. In whatever manner one is to define, believe, unreserved trust, in whatever manner that we are to believe in God, same word, we are to believe in Jesus. If Jesus is not divine, this would be blasphemy. Third, Jesus claims deity in his attributes. Every attribute of God is found in Jesus Christ. We find his sovereignty and omnipotence. To claim sovereignty and omnipotence and absolute power over the entire universe would be madness for a mere creature. And yet Jesus said that he reveals the Father and gives life to whomever he chooses. We see his omnipresence in Matthew 28, verse 20. I am with you always. Could a mere creature say this? We find his omniscience. Jesus knew the thoughts of men, saying to the scribes, Why do you think evil in your hearts? 
His disciples said of him, we see that you know all things. And then Jesus makes this amazing claim in Matthew eleven twenty seven: 27. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. Finally, Jesus claims deity in the book of John. The New Testament has 260 chapters. And earlier I said there is enough evidence in just one chapter of the book of John to prove the deity of Christ. The reason why John's gospel is so important is because the purpose of that book is to prove the deity of Christ. John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now these words are found within the Good Shepherd discourse, where Jesus claims that his hand and the Father's hand are equal in securing the sheep. This oneness speaks of the unity of essence. And of course, they'll go to other passages in John 21, 17, where they talk about other forms of unity. But this is a unity of essence. And at this point, the Jews did not argue like many do today. Well, he claimed to be the Son of God, but some form of lesser deity. He is not God himself. But the Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. They charged him with blasphemy, picked up stones to kill him, saying, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make your self God. The introductory verses of the book of John may be the clearest, most persuasive verses in all of the scriptures on the deity of Christ. Like the beginning of Genesis, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now just imagine, as you're hearing this, you don't know what's coming after these verses. Who is the Word? And not until we come to verse 14 are we told that the Word is Jesus. For it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Where I would like to focus on is verse 3, however, where John says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This verse gives an irrefutable argument that Jesus is God. Now everything in life can be divided into two categories. We have created and uncreated. And of course, God is the only thing that fits in the first category, for he is eternal and uncreated. Everything else, all created things, belong in the second category of uncreated. Now let me read the verse again, where it says that everything, that is all created things, were created through Jesus. There are only two categories. You must have one or the other, and you cannot be both. And so here is the question tonight. What category does Jesus belong in? Now I know that my Muslim friends here tonight will be tempted to place Jesus in the second category, for that is what your theology demands. But the verse will not allow for this. In fact, for emphasis sake, the verse says it two different ways, a negative and a positive, just so we get the point. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus could not have been created, for he created all things, and therefore he belongs in the category one as the divine Son of God. Within the New Testament, we find many passages highlighting both the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. He is called God on the one hand, and yet we find him hungry and thirsty on the other. Muslims like to emphasize the humanity of Christ and emphasize one side while ignoring the side of the deity of Christ. And for Christians, we don't need to choose. It's not either or, it's both and. 
Most certainly, my friend Abu, this evening we'll go to passages like John 14, 28, where Jesus said, My Father is greater than I. Or he'll go to Matthew 24, 36, where he said, Concerning the day and hour, no one knows. Mark 10, 10, where he said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Some Christians see these passages as a major problem for the Christian faith, and we should not. There are clear, rational explanations for these texts, and Christians ought to know how to articulate them. In sum, I have defined the Trinity as God is three persons. Each person is fully God. There is only one God. And we have seen that Jesus claims deity in his titles, his actions, his attributes, and teachings in the book of John. Thank you. Okay, now Abu Bakr has his tongues. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin by praising our Creator, Fashioner, Sustainer, the Almighty One and Only God, Creator of the heavens and the earth. I would like to welcome one and all with the greeting of Jesus and Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Meaning, peace, mercy, and blessings of God be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> the topic is Did Jesus claim to be God? And there would be no use in asking this question unless we first understand who is God. Because many throughout the world have a distorted perception of God. In the Bible, we are taught in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6, Thus says the Lord, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God. In Isaiah chapter 43 verse 11, God Almighty says, I, even I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. In Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9, God says, I am God, there is none else, there is none like me. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods besides me. In the Quran it is stated, Yusabbihu lillahi ma fis samawati wa ma fil ard. Everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies him. Al-Malik, the sovereign, Al-Quddus, the pure, Al-Aziz, the exalted in power, Al-Hakim, the one full of wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, the question before us is, did Jesus claim to be the one and only? Did he claim to be the creator of the universe? The creator of more than 200 billion galaxies in space? Creator of the heavens and the earth? And today I will prove from the words of Jesus himself, whether he said he is God or not. To start, we all sitting here, I think, would agree that God Almighty knows everything. We believe that God Almighty is omniscient there is nothing he does not know. The question is, did Jesus claim to know everything? The answer is given to us by Jesus himself in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verse 32, where Christ says, 
where Christ is speaking about judgment day and he says of that day and that hour no one knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son meaning himself but only the father my dear friends Jesus is informing us that he does not know the hour but the father does know the hour and the Bible tells us in the book of John the first John chapter 3 verse 20 God knows everything but Jesus said that he does not know the hour and therefore cannot be God the Bible tells us in the book of Job chapter 28 verse 24 God sees everything to the ends of the earth and everything under the heavens but we see in the gospel of Mark chapter 11 verse 13 Jesus is returning from a place called Bethany and is hungry and so he sees a fig tree by the road he sees a fig tree from a distance and he goes to the fig tree if happily he might find any fruit thereon but when he comes to the tree there are no fruit thereon Jesus is disappointed and curses the tree ladies and gentlemen anybody reading this would know that Jesus has limitations in his knowledge and therefore he cannot be the one spoken of in Job chapter 28 verse 24 he looks and he knows everything in the earth to the corners of the earth everything to the ends of the earth because Jesus didn't know what was on the fig tree which he saw from a distance And there are many things in the life of Jesus which show that he never ever claimed to be God. My friend, Brother Paul, mentioned a few passages. But I will assure you today, dear friends, that none of those passages, not a single one, show that Jesus claimed to be God. I will mention one or two, the ones that I think are the most used and most common. Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 58, my brother Paul quoted the verse, he said, before Abraham was born, I am. And according to many Christian scholars, the word I am is referring to the great I am. But I will show you that when Jesus said before Abraham was born I am, the word he used was a very common word used by any individual. The word in Greek is ego eimi. Ego eimi. And in the book of John chapter 9 verse 6 Jesus heals the blind man and when the neighbors of the blind man notice that this man is no more blind they start asking one another is this the blind man wasn't he blind and others said no this man just looks like the blind man when the blind man heard this he came forward and said Ego a me, meaning it is me. The blind man is referring to himself, saying, Ego a me, it is me. What does this mean? Ego a me is not the title of Almighty God. Ego a me is not the title of Almighty God because it was used by anybody who is, 
who is identifying himself as the person being referred to. And so there are many things happen, happen, that happened in the life of Jesus which prove that he never claimed to be God. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, we see the devil coming to Jesus and taking him up to a high mountain. And then the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And then the devil says to him, if you bow down and worship me, this will be all yours. All these kingdoms will be yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think anybody believes that the devil can take Almighty God up to a mountain and then the devil says to Almighty God, look at my kingdoms and he shows Almighty God his kingdoms. Does anybody believe that the devil can show God anything when God knows everything? And then the devil says to Almighty God, look what I have for you. All of these, he's tempting Almighty God. Look what I have for you. All of these kingdoms, all of this treasure, all of this money. I will give it to you. Bow down and worship me. Can the devil do this to your creator? No, my dear friends. The devil cannot do this to Almighty God. Because the Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 13, God cannot be tempted by evil. The only reason the devil did this to Jesus is because Jesus is not God. But Jesus clarified this when he responded to the devil. And he said to the devil in Matthew 4.10, Get away from me, Satan. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Jesus is saying to the devil at this critical moment when he is being tempted, I will not worship you and I will not bow down to you because God has written God has instructed, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Does this mean Jesus was claiming to be the God? When He is responding to the temptation of the devil and the devil is saying to Him, worship me, that Jesus by responding to, this, to the devil by quoting the scripture which commands man to worship God alone, does it mean Jesus was showing that he is God or does it mean that Jesus was teaching us that he is a worshiper of God? Obviously, Jesus was teaching us that he is the worshiper of God and that all of us, if we want to enter life, if we want to enter heaven, we should follow Jesus in being the worshippers of God Almighty alone. I often ask myself the question, how would any man who is trying to prove that he is not God express himself in clearer terms than Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ placed his face on the ground and cried to the Father in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 verse 39 and he said my father if it be possible may this cup be taken from me yet not as I will but as you will To all those who love Jesus, do not listen to my words, but listen to his words. 
and do not hear my words but hear the words of Jesus himself who is crying to the Father and praying to the Father and worshipping the Father and he says not as I will but as you will to the believers in Christ I ask you what is Jesus demonstrating to you? What is he teaching you? He is teaching us that he depends on someone's assistance, that he cries to someone and that he worships someone and that he submits his will to someone else's will. And today I urge one and all to submit yourselves to the one who Jesus submitted himself to to the one who Jesus worshipped and that is the one and only God. There are many examples in the life of Jesus where he proved to us not from somebody else's words from his own words that he can never be God. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 18 verse 18 the rich ruler comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And do you know what Jesus says to him? Jesus says to him, Why do you call me good? There is none that is good save one. And that is God alone. Now my dear friend, it is clear to anyone that God will never say, do not call me good. And I don't think anybody who is honest in his heart would think that God will say, don't call me good. There is only one good referring to someone else. But what is Jesus telling us? I don't think it can be made clearer than the way Jesus said it. He said, don't call me good. There is one that is good. And that is God alone. That is God alone. And what is he telling us? He is telling us that there are certain attributes that belong to God alone and he does not accept those attributes for himself. The question before us is who is Jesus of Nazareth? In the words of Peter, the disciple of Jesus, he said in Acts chapter 2 verse 22, O men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did through him. Ladies and gentlemen, what is Peter telling us? Peter is calling Jesus a man. And Peter when referring to the miracles of Jesus, he calls them the miracles of God. If this has any meaning, then it would clearly imply that Peter is not a worshipper of Jesus, but is a worshipper of God and regarded the miracles of Jesus to be done through God, done through him by God Almighty. But Peter did not come to this understanding on his own. He learned this from the Master Jesus Christ himself who said in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12 verse 28 I by the Spirit of God cast out devils. He said in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 verse 20 I by the finger of God cast out devils. In fact Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 30 I can by myself do nothing. I can by myself do nothing. 
you and I know God does as He wills. But not Jesus. He said, I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just. Because I do not seek my will, but the will of Him who sent me. Jesus is telling us that He seeks someone else's will. In John chapter 12 verse 49, Jesus said, I do not speak on my own accord. But we know God speaks on His own accord. And then Jesus says, it is the Father who sent me, who commands me what to say and how to say it. I know that His command leads to eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us know that God speaks on His own accord and God does as He wills. He does not need anyone's permission before speaking. He does not need anyone's authorization before doing something. But Jesus did need the permission of the Father. And therefore, from the words of Jesus himself, it is evident that there is not a single place in the entire Bible of the gospel, in the entire Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John where Jesus says, I am God. In fact, the Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a man. Jesus in John chapter 5 verse 40 in speaking to the Jews he says you are looking for a way to kill me a man who told you the truth I heard from God he calls himself a man God is not a man Numbers 23 19 God is not the son of man but Jesus calls himself the son of man 85 times. So do we believe the scripture? When we say the man who called himself the son of man is God, are we believing in the scripture and the words of God? I don't think so. <laughs> Furthermore, the Bible states in 1 Timothy 6.16 God is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the only ruler who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. But we all know, dear friends, Jesus was seen, Jesus was touched. Jesus was heard. Jesus ate food. Jesus fell asleep. Jesus did the things that human beings do. And I want to mention the warning of Jesus to those who turn away from his clear teachings. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, Jesus said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is telling us that we can sing his praises and give him the titles we want to give him, but that will never ever enter us into heaven. There is only one thing, one way to heaven, Jesus said, and that is doing the will of the Father. And then Jesus said, many will come to me on that day, saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name do great wonders and perform great miracles? And Jesus says, 
I will tell them plainly, get away from me. I never knew you, you evildoers. But my question is, who is Jesus speaking to? Muslims do not do miracles in his name. Hindus do not do miracles in his name. Jews do not do miracles in his name. Who is Jesus speaking to? And why is Jesus so angry that he says to them, get away from me? You know why? Because he said to them in the Gospel of Luke 18, 18, do not call me good, but they took it as though he is God. He said to them in Mark 13, 32, I do not know the hour, but they said, no, 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 Christ knows everything, he is God. They dismissed the teachings of Jesus. They threw away the words of Jesus. He said to them in John 5, 30, I can by myself do nothing, but they said, no, no, no. He can do anything. He is God. Dear friends, this is the reason why Jesus will say to them, Get away from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Why? Because you broke the first and foremost commandment, the commandment of Shema Israel, of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, where Jesus, in his word, says, The most important commandment is this. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad, Ya O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is not two. And with reference to the Trinity, I have given a lecture on the Trinity. Okay. And in my lecture, in my debate, in my previous debate on the Trinity, I have explained in a way that Muslims show an understanding to the Christian belief of the Trinity, that we do understand the Trinity. Christians do say, they do claim that it is not three gods, it is one God. And I have shown that in my debate, uh, which, which will be handed out uh, shortly. But dear friends, it is evident from the words and teachings of Jesus that there is not a single place in Matthew, Mark, Luke or John where Jesus said even one time, even in one instance, I am God. Not even one place. Thank you very much. Abu, where does it say in the Bible where Jesus said, don't call me good? Jesus did not say, don't call me good in Mark 10, nor did he say it in Luke 18, nor did he say it in Matthew 19, nor did he say no one is good but God. We don't know exactly if he pointed his finger to heaven. He might have pointed it at himself. Nonetheless, we know that Jesus did not say don't call me good. In fact, what he actually said was this, why do you call me good? Now that's sleight of hand, but it's different. Jesus loved to ask questions, and the reason he asked questions is because he loved to draw out what was in the heart of man. Did God ask questions in Genesis? Adam, where are you? Uh, Cain killed his brother. Where, where's your brother? He loved to ask questions to draw out what was in the heart, and what was in the heart of the rich young ruler? It was pride. This man had a warped view of goodness. He thought he was good. So Jesus said, okay, let me ask you some questions. And he brought him to the law to show him that he really was not good at all. And finally, when he came to one of the later commands, that man went away sorrowfully because he realized that he loved money more than God. By the way, who is the only one who calls himself good in the New Testament? It's Jesus. I am the good shepherd. Uh, there's so many things uh, to talk about here. I've got 10 minutes, so I'll go quickly. Uh, first of all, when we talk about the nature of Jesus Christ, we need to be careful to remember that Jesus is one who, 
that is one person, and he is two what's. He has two natures. And so whatever question is asked about if Jesus could be, uh, if God could be tired or if God could be thirsty, if Jesus could die, our question, of course, is this. Could he be hungry? In his divine nature, no. In his human nature, yes. Could Jesus die? In his divine nature, no. In his human nature, Yes, and so we have two columns here tonight. We have those that surely show the deity of Christ, and then those that show about Jesus submitting and being tired and being thirsty, and of course, of who is going to one of those two columns. But as Christians, we do not have to choose sides. We can see the natures actually side by side. In fact, sometimes the natures of Jesus, the human and the divine side, are found within the same passage, even within the same verses. For example, let me just read to you from John 5, because he loved to quote John 5.30, where Jesus said, I can do nothing of my own. Of course, that speaks of Jesus' human nature. One of the points of his humility is that he had to come down to earth to live with man, and one of the forms was he had to be tired and thirsty and submit to the Father. But look at all of the passages surrounding that very passage, where it says in verse 18 that he made himself equal with God, or in verse 21, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Or how about verse 23? That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. That is, in the exact same way that we honor the Father, the Bible says we need to honor the Son in the very passage that he quoted. Uh, Ego Eimei talked about that passage as though it's very common, like, I am, ego in me, is as common as my name is Yanni. My question is, when you say my name is Yanni, do people take up stones to kill you? Why would they take up stones to kill Jesus when he says, I am? In fact, where else, including the example that you gave, does Jesus say, or does anyone say, those words alone, without a predicate, ego in me? Of course, we find many examples of I am fill in the blank. But where else in Scripture do we only find ego in me, and why else would they seek to stone him? Why would the men fall back upon the ground when such a claim is made? Uh, we hear words like, my father is greater than I. What does that mean? Well, uh, for example, if I was to say, uh, President Zuma is greater than I, how would you take that? Would you take that to mean that intrinsically he as a person has more value to me? Or do we understand and assume that what we are saying is that Jacob, President Zuma, is greater than me in the sense that he has more wealth, more political power, and certainly more wives? When we find that Jesus says, uh, my father is greater than I, we have to ask the question, greater in what way? Now Muslims automatically assume that Jesus is talking about being greater in essence, that is ontologically, but that is not what the passage says. Of course we know that Jesus was greater, or the father was greater in the sense that he was in his glory. He was in the heavens and Jesus came down to be humiliated. In that particular context, the disciples are selfish. They want Jesus to stay. And Jesus said, if you really loved me, you would want me to go back because my Father is greater than I. Jesus is saying, why would you not want me to return? For in John 17, 5, Jesus says, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Why are you rejoicing with me that I am returning to my Father? For in that sense, he is greater than I. So Abu, this passage says that the Father is greater in office, not in nature. How about the passage, uh, Matthew 26, 
39, my father, if it is possible, let this pass, uh, let this cup pass from me. And of course, we find this is another example of Jesus humiliating himself, coming down to our level, surrendering his will to the Father, and yet revealing no conflict between the Father's desires and his Father's. I love the example of the fig tree in Mark 11 and Matthew 21. And of course, Jesus loved to teach spiritual lessons, and he's quoting from Jeremiah 8.13, and this is a picture of rebellious Israel. Here's the point. Jeremiah 8.13, the Lord says, I went to the vine, there was no grapes. I went to the tree, there was no figs. And now I'm going to Israel, and there is no fruit on the tree. Jesus is simply giving a lesson to them. How about the passage, no one knows the day or the hour in Matthew 13, 32. And of course, we understand that Jesus in his human nature, although he was always God, chose not to pick up some of those divine attributes. Uh, we acknowledge that Jesus grew in wisdom. We acknowledge that for whatever reason, the Father chose not to give this particular information to Jesus. And yet we find other passages where we see that Jesus has omniscience, as we found before. Uh, he quotes Peter as Peter denying uh, the deity of Christ. If we want to quote Peter, uh, let's go to one of the greatest passages saying the deity of Christ in all of Scripture. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, where he gives two descriptions of Jesus Christ, God and Savior. Those are the words of Peter in 2 Peter. And then he brought up the point of uh, the earlier quotes uh, about quoting Isaiah, and we say, great, we love those passages. We love those passages in Isaiah when Yahweh says, I am, Jesus picks up those words also, there's the example of Son of Man. Uh, Son of Man is such a glorious example of uh, deity, where Jesus is quoting Daniel, and the Son of Man is given dominion and glory in the kingdom and the nations in the language, Daniel 7, 13 through 14. And then finally, he says the will of God is to do good works. Muslims do not believe in faith alone in Christ. They believe in order to enter heaven, you must do good works. He said we must do the will of the Father, and that is true. So my question is this in closing. What is the will of the Father? I agree we must do the will of the Father. What is it? Well, we find that in John 5, 23, and Luke 10, 16, and John 6, 29. The work of God is this. The will of my Father is this, that anyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. That is the will of the Father. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, to begin by, with the name of God Almighty, the most gracious, the most merciful. It is interesting that uh, to me, when I look at the very verses quoted, for example, if I look at just John 10:30, you know, the very verses that were quoted. Those very verses prove that Jesus is not God, and I will show you how. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. And Paul pointed out that when Jesus made the statement, the Jews start, wanted to kill him. The Jews picked up stones to throw at him. And that is true. But what Christians seem to not understand is what Jesus said to the Jews when they picked up the stones to throw at him. What did he say to them? He said to them, is it, he, he said to them, for which, for which of my works do you stone me? Something to that effect. And so the Jews say, we do not stone you for good works, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And then Jesus responds to that. He answers that allegation. And he says to them, Is it not written in your scripture? I say, ye are gods. God calls the Jews gods. 
And Jesus is quoting Psalms chapter 82. And he said to them, You are called gods. Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I say, I am God's son. I say, I am God's son. You are called gods. How then can you accuse me of blasphemy? Jesus is clarifying that he was not claiming in any way, shape or form to be God. So the very verses quoted in themselves show a different picture when we read the entire context. Because God would never say, God would never justify the title that he has for the titles of the Jews. God speaks his titles without give, without saying that my titles are like your titles. God would never say, because you are called this title, you are called God, I can call myself the Son of God. God would never say that. And the expression, I am the Father, are one, or the, the sentence or the statement, it does not mean that Jesus is claiming to, claiming to be the person of the Father. And Christians recognize that because they believe that we should not confound the persons. It is a oneness in purpose. It is not a oneness in person. And that's what the Trinity teaches itself. And so Jesus, when we study every chapter of the Bible, every way with Brother Paul brought up John chapter 5, where Jesus speaks about he will raise from the dead. But who gives him the authority to raise from the dead? He says in John chapter 5, the Father, just as the Father has life in himself, the Son also, he gives the Son also to have life in himself. So in other words, this authority comes from the Father. And he says shortly after this, I can by myself do nothing. In Matthew 12, 28, I by the Spirit of God cast out devils. In Luke 18, 18, Paul pointed out that I made a mistake when I said, when I, when I, when I said, Jesus said, do not call me good. And Paul is right. Jesus said, why do you call me good? But that was not my point. My point was, that Jesus refused the attribute of good. When he said, why do you call me good? He said, the, he, he said a sentence after that. And that must be remembered. That must be quoted. He said, there is none that is good save one. And that is God alone. So if he called himself good somewhere else, here he is saying, there is only one that is good. And he is clearly referring to God alone and not himself. Because before this he says, why do you call me good? There is none that is good, save one that is God alone. Is he referring to himself? Anybody can see who reads that, that Jesus is not referring to himself, he is referring to the Father. And so I think from the words of Jesus, it becomes clear that Jesus, when we look at his words in depth, he was not claiming to be God. John 1.13 was quoted. First Paul said all things were made by him. My Bible says all things were made through him. Very big difference. Now Paul then went on to quote it again and says all things were made through him. So I'm not sure which one it is but my Bible says all things were made through him. Now the question is first these are not the words of Jesus. These are not the words of Jesus. But these very words prove that Jesus is not God because you would never say about God things were made through him. You would say he made everything. He is Al Khalik, the creator, Al Barak, the inventor. He is the creator. God doesn't say all things were made through me. That's a, that's a very awkward way of referring to God as the Creator. And therefore, Jehovah's Witnesses believe, based on that verse, that
that Jesus was the first creation and he was the means of everybody else's creation. But the very verse itself shows us that somebody else made through Jesus. So I think when we look at the very verses quoted to try and point out the divinity of Jesus, those verses themselves do not actually show us that he is God. And so my dear friends, I would like to conclude with the words of Jesus in Mark 13, 32, where he said, he does not know the hour. And the Father does know the hour. So what does this mean? God Almighty, Paul said he has two natures. He has the human nature and the divine nature. But how can God Almighty not know something? And if Jesus is God, then that would mean, if he had two natures, then that would mean he knew something and didn't know something at the same time. But that's impossible. You cannot not know something and then know something at the same time. You either know it or you don't. So therefore, the, 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 the concept of two natures is a concept of impossibility. It, it, does, it is not at all true. It, cannot, it does not make any sense because God is infinite and human beings are finite. You cannot be finite and infinite at the same time. It's like saying, I have a squared circle. You cannot have a squared circle. The cir it's either a circle and then it doesn't have any corners, it, or if it's a square, it has corners. You cannot have a squared circle. It's impossible. Jesus cannot have two natures, man and God at the same time, simply because God is God and knows everything. Man does not know everything. And so if these two natures mix, these are opposites. They cannot mix, they cannot intermingle. And so it is evident from this, from a, from a very basic point, that Jesus he does not have two natures. He has the human nature, which is the nature he always speaks about, and that is where he makes these quotations, says these statements, uh, and he shows us that he is not God. Thank you. Time for Paul to cross examine on the for seven minutes. Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah, am I correct? Yes. Uh, the Messiah is portrayed as eternal in the Old Testament, Isaiah 9 6 and Micah 5 2. How do you explain this since the Messiah is eternal and only God is eternal? Okay, thank you, Paul. Isaiah 9 6 means that to us a child is born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, his name will be Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and uh, also God. Uh, Never after Mighty God. Yeah. Mighty God. So, first of all, if you say that's a prophecy for Jesus, then Jesus should have called himself Everlasting Father or Mighty God. He should have at least called himself that. So, first of all, from the very onset, there is already a problem with the argument because in order for the prophecy says his name will be everlasting father. But no, his, name, his name is mighty God. This is the Messiah he brought to us a child is born. So Isaiah would you, yes, are, are, would you agree that this is referring to the Messiah here? No, not necessarily. I think we need to read scripture and assess. Who, who is the child here? I, 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 well, I, I do not know who is the child, but if it refers to Jesus, then it must be fulfilled by him calling himself by the Why? Names. Why must why must he refer to himself as that name? Because for any prophecy to be fulfilled, then what is written in the prophecy must happen. Exactly, it did. But you're uh, saying uh, he uh, must happen. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm sorry, you Christian. Right, I think I think the, the distinction here is you're saying that he has to refer to himself by that name. Uh, my question is who is this child? Um, if we both have a high view of God, I would claim I do, you do as well. I would think this would be very important for you to find out who this child is that is referred to 
as mighty God. Now, Christians have an easy answer for that. It's Jesus. Who do you say that child is? You see, I will not have... Uh, there, there isn't clear answers for every prophecy in the Old Testament. As you would imagine, there are many prophecies in the Old Testament, some of which are not, we do not have clarity for, we do not have a fulfillment in them. Some, some of the prophecies, we agree with that. There are many prophecies. I, I, I'm sure there can be a whole book written on the prophecies that are still to be fulfilled in the Old Testament. So I don't think you can suggest that, that, uh, that we should definitely know how to define that person until that person comes about. But let's say, let's, let, let me, let me um, for the sake of the argument, concede for now, uh, hypothetical, hypothetically, you know, that Jesus is referred to. Uh, uh, then what part of that passage uh, do you say suggests? Is it mighty God that you say? Yes. Um, the, the word in the Hebrew uh, used for mighty God is Hail the Bow. And if you look up Ezekiel 31 11, you will find that the king of Babylon is also referred to as Ale. And so there the translators do not translate it as God, but they translate it as leader. But the same word that you are using to pinpoint that Jesus is God is a word found used in reference to the king of Babylon. And so if it, if it is used for the king of Babylon, it wouldn't prove that the king of Babylon is God, just as it wouldn't prove that the person referred to today is God. Uh, in addition to Isaiah 9, 6, Micah 5, 2, where um, the Messiah is referred to as coming from old and from the ancient of days. So both of these passages, it's clear that Messiah is more than just a prophet uh, for these to be fulfilled, but it, it refers to him as eternal. Um, uh, in, I think in the Old Testament, even, even in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse, uh, Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 5, God says to Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's womb, before, you, before I formed you, I knew you. Uh, in Islam, we also have a concept in the Quran where we, there was an existence before we came to earth. There was an existence where God Almighty took from the lives of the children of Adam their descendants and made them testify concerning themselves. So it is difficult to, to, to say that that passage means that the individual is God because it could have various meanings. Uh, okay, and let's move on. Uh, John 12, 41. Uh, this is the vision of Isaiah in the throne room of God. And Isaiah, the passage in John 12, 41 says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Now the context demands that him is Jesus. How would you answer that verse? Um, I wouldn't have a problem looking at Jesus as a glorified being. I don't know what uh, what you would say that the, the the vision of Isaiah in Isaiah nine six, where he, he sees Yahweh in all of his glory, and then when we come to John twelve forty one, and that's explained to us, and it says Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who is the him in John twelve forty one? Um, I, I, well, let's, let's read John chapter 1. Who, who do you suggest that it is? Jesus. Absolutely. John chapter 1. Um, the man of Nath, am I, is it, sorry, I'm, I'm opening John chapter 1. Or could you speak to me, please? Ah, I'll one. read it again. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Of course, uh, this context is Jesus. We find Jesus in 36, we find him throughout. Who is the him there? To um, us, this is obvious, this is Jesus, and if it is Jesus, then this seems to be clearly showing that what Isaiah saw in the throne room, in Isaiah 6, was Yahweh, it was Jesus. Okay, but I wonder, I wonder the relevance of that when we're talking about whether Jesus claimed to be God. Because if we're going to bring in prophecies from the Old Testament, we know in the Old Testament, people are referred to as even God. The Jews are called gods. Elohim, you know, never Yahweh. Yeah, I'd be happy to concede that. But you know, Jesus, Jesus, when Jesus in the New Testament does not refer to himself as Yahweh. He refers to himself as I am. But look, we're not going to get off the track here. What I'm saying is. But, 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 but how? I want to know. I mean, my, you my, can ask my, that my, question. My, my, my premise for my presentation is based on the topic. 
And the topic is whether Jesus himself said he is God. Because there's so many prophecies. You say Isaiah saw his glory. Now, I wonder if Jesus is referred to as God by Isaiah or by anybody else. First of all, that passage doesn't allude to that, to, to, to necessarily that, it, that to Jesus. Maybe it re refers to Yahweh himself. So I think exactly. I do think it refers to Yahweh. What I am asking is, yes. who is the His and the Him? And if you say it's not Jesus, my question is, why do you say that? If it's not Jesus, well, the first thing is this is a prophecy in the Old Testament. I I wouldn't uh, actually have really read all the prophecies in the Old Testament. But what I what I have, what I have proven, I think, is that Jesus Himself never claimed to be God. And I think, I think the question needs to be directed to whether Jesus said he is God or not. Not what Isaiah said or what, you know, the, the author of John uh, referred to Jesus as uh, going back to the prophecy. I think, you know. Okay, so have you answered this question, it's your turn. Okay. Um, Paul, I, from the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, verse 18, you see Jesus says, do not or uh, you corrected me, why do you call me good? And then he says, There is none that is good save one. And that is God alone. Is Jesus refusing the attribute, repudiating the attribute of God for himself? Absolutely not. Okay. Then is Jesus referring to himself when he says why do you call me good? There is none that is good save one. Remember, we don't know if he's pointing his finger upwards. Okay, but, but we point our fingers upwards because God Almighty is one. So, but, uh, Unless you're Jesus, then you can point to yourself. <laughs> okay, but what, what, why is Jesus referring to himself? When he said there is none that is good? Because he's saying, why do you call me good? Uh -huh. Right. Right? Why do you call me good? Right. There is none that is good. Right. Save one. Yeah, I, I, maybe you, 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 you say Jesus wasn't pointing about, but there is none that is good, save one. Why do you call me good? Right. So what's your question? And that is God alone. My question is, is it not clear to you that Jesus is not referring to himself in that passage? I don't think the context says either way, and I don't think the passage here is, uh, the point of the passage is to claim the deity of Christ. Right. Jesus does not have to claim his deity in every passage. Now, we can we can pull from that that if no one is good but God, Jesus calls himself good, therefore Jesus is God. I think that's a syllogism that I take. Okay, but in that case, what I would try and understand, first of all, is that are you accepting that Jesus Jesus is, is, is repudiating that attribute? Because now I'm a bit confused whether you are you, are, you think Jesus is referring to himself as God there and he says God alone, or is he referring to himself with that attribute? Yeah, this, this man had a misconception of what good meant. And so what Jesus wanted to do is he wanted to prove to this man that he's not good. And so he's going to take him to the law and show him that he's really not good at all. So I think that's the point of the passage. But, uh, but, but that may be the point, but I'm asking again uh, that when Jesus is saying no one is good except God alone, who is he referring to as God alone? God. The God man. Jesus would be included in that. Absolutely. Okay, so and, and I have no problem saying that's not explicit in the passage. It's explicit in other passages. Okay. But uh, I think, I think yeah, it's very clear that Jesus is not referring to himself. How is that clear? Because he said, because he is asking, why do you call me good? There is no one that is good. So because he's asking except, a question. God, no, he's not just asking a question. He's saying, why do you call me good? He is, said, he is showing the person that you should not be calling me good. Because what after it clarifies is because there is one that is good. And that is God alone. I don't think it can be clearer than that. Uh, maybe we could say from this passage, uh, 
right, maybe we could say from this passage, and I'd be happy to talk longer about this, because uh, you still haven't refuted the syllogism of this. No one is good but God. Jesus calls himself good, therefore Jesus is God. I think I, 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 I think I, I, what the... Uh, let, let me ask you another question, but I am quoting the words of Jesus in Luke 18, 18, and I'm looking for clarity on that from your side. Yes. And you seem to not be clarifying whether Jesus is referred to as God there, or, or accepting but the Jesus is God. or accepting, no, in that passage. But let, let, let me move you on to a similar passage, maybe there it will be easier to understand. John 17, 3. Jesus is, Jesus is speaking to God and he's saying to God that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. My question is, who is Jesus referring to as the only true God? Uh, let me just read the passage and move up to the context. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give him eternal life to all. And this is eternal life, that, you, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, there are certainly passages, and there are certainly places in the New Testament where God is referring to God the Father. So I have no problem with the passage when it says God, it's referring to God the Father. But of course, there are other times when Jesus is included in that as well. But I'm talking about John 17, 3. There Jesus yes. is referring to the Father. I'm asking Jesus, when he says, when he's speaking to God, and he's saying that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent, I'm asking, who is Jesus referring to as the only true God? Uh, Jesus is, Jesus would be included in that, but specifically the Father in that case. Okay, way, I'm, then I'm going to ask you, where history of humanity had any person says you and he needs me. No, I, I don't have a problem with this specifically in that passage in verse 3, I have no problem with that referring to Father. Oh, we have no problem with that referring to the Father. So then Jesus is calling the Father the only yes, true absolutely. God. Absolutely. And that, what does that mean, Jesus? He is, a, he is the only true God as well. But, but Jesus is calling the Father the only true God. How can this be? Okay. So there is, there is a clause here because we fail to understand the definition of the Trinity. We are saying that there is only true, uh, there is only one true God, and yet there are three persons within that true God. And so we can say that Jesus Christ is the only true God. The Father is the only true God. And the Holy Spirit is the only true God. Now what you are implying, if I could finish here, what you are implying is that for monotheism to exist, it must mean singularity. So when you say God is one, you are implying that it means singularity. I am happy to say that the Father is the only true God. And I am also happy to say that Jesus Christ is the only true God and the Holy Spirit is the only true God. And there's no but, but, but Paul, you just now, you just now said it. Jesus was, in, and you were correct in saying, Jesus is calling the Father Absolutely. the only true God. Absolutely. And how many only true gods do you get? Uh, there is only one true God in three persons. Uh, I'm happy to continue that uh, line of thought because I think it's important. If I can just clarify it again. Yes, there is only one true God in three persons. Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. So let me just keep on going down this trail. Um, you say that Jesus as God is illogical. The Trinity is illogical. If the Father is God, it's illogical for Jesus to be God. My question is, why is it or illogical, or stated another way, what rule of logic, what law of logic does this break? Okay, let me clarify. Why is it completely against logic and it's, it's impossible? Let me clarify that. The reason why it's totally against logic is because if you, if, I'm, I'm sure you, you know the Athanasian Creed very well. Uh, you, you, believe, you believe the Athanasian Creed is correct, I take it. The Athanasian Creed. Yes, in the Athanasian Creed, it teaches that the Father is completely God, the Son 
He is completely God. And I, I want everyone to listen to this. And the Holy Spirit is also completely God. So what does the Athanasian Creed say? The Father is God on His own. Meaning the Father is a distinct person from the Son. The Son is God on His own. The Holy Spirit is God on His own. These are persons who are completely God and are distinct. And yet, these three persons, if each of, or each of them is completely God, then it does not equal to one God. Okay, but my question, is, God. my question is specific. What rule of logic does it break? You say it's illogical. My question is, what rule of logic does it break? For example, what, what, you... what, one plus one plus one equals three. Okay, but we're not we're not adding that way. We're, it's not one plus one plus one equals one. Okay. If you want to really do mathematics, you can do one times one times one times one equals one. <laughs> and, and then how do you add it like the like father by the son? Well, why do you add them? We, we don't believe it. Really you, you added them in the Athanasian Creed. You said they are distinct. Okay. You said each one is completely God on his okay. own. Let me clarify what so I mean by, clear, by the law of logic. Uh, there's a law of non-contradiction. For example, I can't say my car is parked outside the church, but my car is not parked outside the church. That's a law of non-contradiction. That's illogical. If I was to say I believe in three gods and I believe in one God, that's illogical. My question is, Christians believe in one God in three persons. What rule of logic does that break? Well, you are saying one God in three persons. Yes. But as soon as you read the Athanasian Creed, which I quoted now, where it states the Father is completely God, and the Son simultaneously on his own is completely God, and the Holy Spirit is completely God. Now, if each person in the Godhead on their own is a distinct person and is completely God, then you, there is no way on earth that can be one God. Okay, let's move on. Um, 2 Kings 5, 7 says, this is God speaking, I am God. Can I kill and bring back life? Of course, we know that God alone has the power over life. How do you explain the words in John 5, 21, where Jesus says that he gives life to whom he will? Okay. Very, very simple. If you just cross over to John 5, 26, you will see that Jesus is speaking about life eternal. And if you read the whole passage, you will see that Jesus is saying in John chapter 5, verse 26, Christ is saying that very, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And in 27, he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. And I want to go back to verse 24, it was the one that I want to quote. Verily I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Jesus is referring to death and life in the spiritual context, not in the physical context. Furthermore, even if you want to refer to him as giving life to whomsoever he wants, which I can prove clearly, it doesn't mean that because in John 8 51, Jesus says, Whoever keeps my word or obeys my word will not see death. What does he mean by okay, this? phrase in verse 23, my question is, or in verse, 20, uh, in verse 21, that phrase that Jesus gives life to whom he will. What, what does that phrase mean? That, that means that Jesus, he guides and gives the light of guidance, the eternal life. That light phrase means light. he gives guidance? Yes, well, that's what it means in John 8, 51. No, I'm, I'm talking about this verse, verse 23. But he gives life to whom he will. What does that verse phrase mean? Verse, verse 24 explains it with the, with, the, with the words of Jesus. Whoever believes the one who sent me has crossed over from death to life. How does someone cross over from death to life? This is the word of Jesus in verse 24, just the verse after that. It doesn't mean someone becomes becomes alive from, from physical death. It means someone gets spiritual life. 
Jesus is talking about life eternal, and Jesus constantly, I can, I'll be happy to show you from other references, whenever Jesus talks about life, many a times, if not most of the times, it's about eternal life. And it should not be mistaken to, to mean that Jesus is giving life, but even if it means that, it says that he has been given that authority by someone else. And God is never ever given authority to do something. God is the giver of authority. He's never the one who is given. So he does not have life in himself and it's given to him. God gave it to him. So then it's not in himself. That's what that's what he says in verse 26. He said that the Father gave it to him. Let's move on to verse 23, then John 5, 23. That all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. So in whatever way that we are to honor the Father, whatever that word means to honor, then in the same way we need to honor the Son. Yeah. How, do you, how do you explain verse 23? Well, I would simply read the full verse. I would just read the full verse. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Whoever does not honor the Son exactly. does not honor the Father who sent him. So we all you. believe that. We all believe if you don't honor the messenger of God, the Messiah of God, the person who is sent by God, then you are showing disrespect to God. You are dishonoring the Father. Okay, so would you look, would you take the Father there to be God? Yes. Okay. Indeed. So in whatever way we are to honor the Father, would you agree that we are also to honor the Son in the exact same way? Uh, I, I don't think Jesus is implying that at all. Then what does it mean? What do those words mean when it says that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father? It means by honoring the Son, you are honoring the Father. By respecting and loving the Son, you are loving the Father. By rejecting the Son, you are rejecting the Father. Similar to what Jesus said to the Jews, if you love me, you would believe me. If you love God, if God was your Father, you would believe me because okay. He sent me. Okay. So, Jesus, How would you define honor there? What does it mean to honor the Father there? It means accepting Him and believing His words, following his teachings, that's what it means. It means when he comes to you, he wants you to do something, you do as he wills. That's what it means. It means you follow the message of God. Okay. Uh, in reference to the Son of Man, by the way, I stopped my clock, so I'm not sure how much time I have left, but uh, in reference to the Son of Man, um, if the Son of Man is merely a, a human title, uh, is there any other past, is there any other person that ever refers to Jesus as the Son of Man? Uh, where somebody else should to Jesus. Right. Or does he only use it for himself? Uh, no, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of okay. Man. Okay, so he I, only refers... I'm not okay. sure if there's other passages where... It's, okay, so I, he I know only... In the Old Testament, there is that's correct. Like one man, the Son of Man. He only refers to himself as the Son of Man. And then he takes that title, Son of Man, from Daniel 7, where it is said that he will be given all authority and dominion and power forever and ever. So this is a two-pronged question. Number one, how do you view the title Son of Man in light of the prophecy in Daniel 7? And then, if it only meant a man, why would Jesus only use that for himself when everyone believed he was a man? Because, okay. because it may be a title, Son of Man, that Jesus is using for himself. It may be an honorable title. That Jesus, it may be that Jesus wants to specifically show us that He is the Son of Man, meaning He is human. That's why He refers to Himself as that. And there could be many, many explanations for why He refers to Himself as that. But the biggest and most important thing is what Jesus says about Himself. In Daniel 7 14, if it refers to Jesus, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that referring to Jesus. But that does not suggest, and nothing in that verse suggests, that He is God. It just says all nations will will serve him. And I don't have a problem with believing that all nations should indeed serve Jesus. So the, 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 the main argument I think tonight and the key to the debate is what did Jesus claim for himself and whether he claimed to be God anyway, anyway throughout the Gospels. Uh, oh. um, we were mentioning Mark 13, 32, where Jesus says he does not know the hour. 
Um, now, how can he be God if he does not know the hour? Because he has two natures. Okay, so he 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 has two natures, but he is God in the flesh, according to yes. Christian belief. He's, and he is he while he has the human nature, his divine nature is still with him. It's not he he he, he, is, he has both natures at the same time. So how is it possible if he had the divine nature with him for him to say he does not know the hour? Because very good, if he was God in the flesh, even though he had the human nature, his divine nature does know the hour. So why is he saying he that he is saying I do not know the hour. Well, and know the sun, know the sun. Yes, it is, it is true that he did not know the hour, and he was also hungry and thirsty. And so all this tells us is that Jesus, as a man, so humiliated himself that he took on the weaknesses of humans in human flesh. Now, if we are to say that this is beyond our reason, I have no problem with this. We're talking about the Trinity and something that our minds cannot completely grasp. But it does not mean that it is contrary to reason. It might be far above us. And I would think you as a Muslim of all people would not have a problem with the two natures and it is incomprehensible to us since the Quran says that Allah is incomprehensible and we cannot fully understand him. So as soon as Christians come across and we give a high and lofty idea of God that we cannot totally comprehend, certainly is not irrational, certainly is not illogical, but certainly goes beyond our understanding so that we can completely understand him. But, but my, 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 well, my question now would be, Jesus knows that he is God in the flesh. Yes. And he knows that he, and he has the divine nature. So how did he not know the hour why he is God in the flesh and therefore should be omniscient? Yeah, in his human nature, God had not revealed it to him. Sorry? In his human nature, God, God, had chosen, God the Father had not chosen to reveal that truth to him. But he was not only in his human nature when he said that, was he? He was also in his divine nature. Yes. So how so why would he, why would you say that his human nature he was not living to him because he was in his divine nature. In the same way that you can say that Jesus died, but in his divine nature he did not die. Precisely. Exactly. But if you say he didn't die in his divine nature, then how was it the, the infinite sacrifice? How, how, how do people say God had to die? Don't you say God had to die for our sins? Okay, if now this is a separate a question about the atonement. <laughs> if you want to be consistent here, then what I would say to you, Abu, is if you want to be consistent, then if you're trying to show that Jesus was not omniscient, then let me ask you, if I can show that Jesus did know all things, would you accept him as God? Uh, no, because he didn't say that. Uh, you, 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 you can try and allude or assume that Jesus said he doesn't know the hour, so how is it possible for you to contradict it? That's where the problem is, because now you're going to be contradicting his, related, his straightforward statement. Yeah. He said he doesn't know the hour. And he didn't say that's only in his human nature. He just said the sun, uh, uh, neither the sun, nor the sun, meaning that's himself completely. And for you to, to, to say that it's only, only in nature of him, I don't think it's, 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 it's uh, fair to Jesus. Actually, think, Jesus did claim to be omniscient. Um, in Matthew eleven twenty seven. Jesus says this, No one that knows the Son except the Father and no one knows the Father except the Son. Now just think about this for a moment. No one knows the Father except the Son. That is, God is so incomprehensible uh, that Jesus Christ knows the Father. So I would say Jesus Christ is omniscient, but there are times in his human nature that he has weaknesses or he has areas that God has not given him revelation. Okay. Last, last question. Last question. Okay, but then I'm asking, how can he know something, because he is omniscient, you said, and simultaneously not be omniscient and not know things? How can he know things, being omniscient and not omniscient simultaneously at the same time? How is that possible? Because I, I, I put it to you that even God, even God, 
cannot not know and know something at the same it's time. It's not incomprehensible. It's not like incomprehensible. It depends what you mean by incomprehensible. Can it be fully understood? His greatness, the depth of his greatness, we, we can understand the ex, we can understand to a certain extent that he is beyond and okay, he is so he cannot of, be fully but, understood. But and he is the greatest and he is the all the, right. full of power, but but uh, he, he cannot be fully understood. But Jesus, Jesus, but Allah didn't say he doesn't know something. No way in the Quran does Allah say he doesn't know something, or Allah has two natures. The problem here is you are taking one man and you are saying he is infinite and finite. He is all knowing and not all knowing at the same time. Now, Allah is all knowing. It's not, you don't have the problem of saying Allah doesn't know something and knows something at the same time. You take Jesus and say that he knew something and didn't know things at the same time. How is that possible? Because he has two natures. Uh, if we said he was, if we say that he is infinite and finite in the same way, in the same nature, then yes, that would be illogical. But you cannot show me what law of logic that Jesus in two natures breaks. If God can do all things, why could he not have taken on human nature? But being completely God and completely man at the same time does not, why then would he say he doesn't know something? Because he was still completely God. That's my point. Why he made that statement, why would he say, knowing that he is completely God, that he doesn't know something? That's my point, and that's where that, that's the key to understanding that he didn't have two natures. Because if you say he had two natures, then he had one mind. He didn't have two minds, and so if he didn't have two minds, how is it possible that he would be omniscient and not omniscient at the same time? Once you have answered this question, we stop the discussion. There will be a break for uh, say five to ten minutes. Yeah, I would say the same thing. Jesus has two natures, and the fact that Jesus can say that he knows the Father in the same way that the Father knows the Son. It must be infinite knowledge. Of course, God knows the Son in a way that is intrinsic. God did not have to learn, otherwise he wouldn't be God. And in the same way, whatever way the Father knows the Son, is the same way the Son has to know the Father. So if we say that the Father knows the Son infinitely, then in the same way, and the same word is used, then the Son must, in the same way, know an incomprehensible God. Uh, <laughs> I've been told that uh, our Muslim friends have to go to prayer now, so we will resume as soon as I First, we want to ask a question from uh, Abu Bakr. Stand this side, please. Those who want to ask a question from Paul, stand this side, please. You want to ask a question from from uh, Abu Bakr. You can start. Okay, then. How do you interpret before Abraham, I am? If you use your interpretation of I am in the scripture. Question. That's a very good question. Uh, what do I mean if I use my interpretation that Jesus is not God? How do I explain I am? Am I right? Yeah. Because uh, before Abraham, I am, how do you interpret that if you use your interpretation of I am in the scripture? Okay. We would interpret that to mean that Jesus was speaking not literally. If you look at that whole passage, Jesus just says before that, anyone who hears and obeys my word, will not taste death. So all those who obeyed Jesus did die. But Jesus is not speaking literally. He's speaking in a different and spiritually. Therefore he's saying before Abraham was born, I am. Now uh, what was alluded to in our lecture, in our, in our debate just now, was I am is the name of God. But if I am is the name of God, then we should be able to replace the word I am appearing there with the name Jehovah. And if we do that, before Abraham was Jehovah. It's an incomplete statement. If, we, if, if, if I am refers to the title I am, then it's an incomplete statement because. Yes. If we can just explain uh, the format, uh, whoever the question is addressed to, they'll get one minute to respond, and then the other person will have 30 seconds. 
Uh, I think it's an excellent question, John 8.58. Um, first of all, if it was merely to show pre-existence before Abraham was, I was, that would still show the deity of Christ. That was thousands of years earlier. And yet Jesus went even beyond that and said before Abraham was, I am clearly pulling from the phraseology in Isaiah where Yahweh referred to himself as Ego I am. There's a question to Paul. Uh, Paul. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the servant of God. If you can look at Matthew 12, 18. So how can he be God when he was the servant of God? Well, uh, I think that's a, a beautiful truth that Jesus Christ came down to earth not to fight, not to rule. Uh, we already have a preconception that Jesus should be a ruler, even going back to Abu's claims before about how uh, when Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4. And of course, jumping down would attract a lot of people's attention and they would set him up as the king. But that is not why Jesus came to earth. Jesus Christ came to earth to die. He came to earth not to be served, as the scripture says, but to serve. And so I think that is a beautiful example of Jesus' humility, that he came down from the heights of glory, came down to the depths of humiliation in order to die for sinners. Yeah, I think, I think the, the question we would always, the question we would always uh, have for the same, same uh, argument is that how can God be called a servant? How can God be called the Lamb of God? These are things you don't use for God Almighty. And I know it's explained away by Jesus' human nature, but I think it was seen earlier that Jesus cannot have two natures, and therefore he cannot be a servant and at the same time be Yahweh, be God Almighty. He is either the servant of God or he is God. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot have a square circle. Jesus cannot be God and man at the same time. That's simply how it is. And then I will come. Who is the Jesus? According to Islam and according to Christianity. In short, Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ mentioned in the Quran 25 times. He is, he is his, his birth. We believe that he was born miraculously, that he had no earthly father, and we believe that, that this was the miracle of God. We believe that Jesus is the Word of God, the Spirit given by God. Jesus is the Christ. We believe in him, we love him, and we in Islam emulate him. We name our children after him, and we name our children after his mother because we love him. I'm not sure if I'm, 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 I'm in the one minute, I don't know how much I can say, but uh, Jesus in Islam and Christianity, uh, sorry, and the Bible, it's not, it's not a very different picture when it comes to whether he's God. Uh, when it comes to his humanity, there may be differences, uh, but overall, you can see from the scripture that the Quran says that Jesus is not God and say, say with the Bible. Jesus Christ is the greatest expression of God Almighty. Jesus Christ came down to earth, according to John 1, took on human flesh as a servant, lived a holy, perfect life, died on the cross, three days later rose again, Defeating sin and death, all those who trust in Jesus Christ and his claims will be saved. If we, we do assume that Jesus is God, the words uh, from John 5, verse 36 and 27, what would be the implication of that to us as people on this earth? Okay. And read the John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And as I mentioned before uh, in our cross-examination, according to 2 Kings, no one has authority over life except God himself. Now the argument may be, hey, we have examples of those who brought people back to life. We think of Elijah, and we think of Paul who brought people back to life. But those were tools of God. It is not said of Jesus in the same way. So again, let me read that. That Jesus has life 
in himself. That is, life is intrinsic in Jesus Christ. My, my response is, if you read the verse very carefully, sir, this very verse will prove to you very clearly that Jesus is not God. Because this very verse says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. God is not granted authority. God is not granted power. He has power. He grants the power. So I think if you carefully analyze that verse, we don't have a problem with loving Jesus and, and showing him as the greatest of the greatest people. But we have a problem when we make the mistake of, of saying that, that he is God because he had life. That life was given to him by the Father. That's what the text says. And if it was given to him by the Father, it proves that he is under the Father's authority. God is under no one's authority. Next question to Abu Bakr. Sorry. Um, my question was also including verse 27, which also um, where the Father has given the Son the authority to judge. Yes. Well, no, but that is another question. Sorry. Uh, next question to Abu Bakr. Thank you. I'm just, I've just two or three uh, questions. Um, Abu, why are you directly denying? The claim that Jesus himself personally made to John 10, 10 13, saying, I and the Father are one, Ebu Kai, Mopate, and Esme. And you also misinterpret the, the meaning of one. You said it means uh, for an it's a purpose, which is not in Greek, it simply means one in nature. And also the word for that in nature is, in is nature, in nature is also not in Greek. Esme means one in nature. I and the Father are one in nature. No, it doesn't, doesn't mean one in nature. It means one. Please, let me finish Okay. Just complete the question, please. No. The question is, why are you denying the direct statement made by Jesus himself? Say, Ebo a b over there and Esme. Okay, thank you. Okay, which one do you want me to answer? Because they give me one minute. I, I would like to answer both. As they they gave me two minutes. Like if they give me two minutes, I can answer both. Which one would you like me to answer? I can answer either one. John 10 30 or Ego Ini? Which one? Ego Ini? John 10 30. John 10 30. Well, I think it's a typical example of where we read one verse and claim it means Jesus is God. But that verse, if you read John 17 21, Jesus is praying for all those who believe in him and he says that they all may be one in us. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us. And the verse does not say one in nature, it says one. You're putting one in nature in there because that's the Trinitarian concept, that's your, your belief. But you do not do that to the Word of God, add into the Word of God. Now, if you, if you leave the text as it is, this very passage proves that Jesus is not God because he then denies the allegation by showing the Jews that they are called with similar titles, so it's not blasphemy for him to call himself the Son of God. Again, John 17, 21, Jesus calls all the disciples one in us. Does that mean you have 12 gods? No. Uh, I still don't think he answered the, uh, the question of what it means to be one. Yes, we would say that it means uh, one in nature. And if, not only do Christians believe it that way, it's as though we're just appealing to those who believe the same things. Even Jesus' enemies knew what Jesus was saying because they picked up stones. And later on it says uh, in the passage that you are making yourself God in verse 33. So the friends of Jesus know it's speaking about nature and the enemies of Jesus no, it speaks of nature. Um, can God alone give eternal life? If we read Luke 18, that has been used quite a lot by others. The question there, I've got only I've got the trans Bible, so it might be different translation in English. What verse is this? 18, Luke 18, verse, verse 20. When the person asks Jesus, good master, what must I do to get eternal life? That's my translation. And in the uh, 22nd verse, Jesus answers him, follow me to get eternal life. So 
So what must one do to get eternal life? Only through God? Yes. Excellent question. Thank you for, for that question. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a common passage that Abu and Muslims will go to and they'll say, look, Jesus even said that doing good works is what it takes to be saved in order to receive eternal life. This is the will of God. Well, my question is, define good works. Jesus said do good works. Define good works. This is how he defines it, John 6, 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one who he sent. Or in John 6, 40, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. So I agree with Abu that we must do the work of God and that we must do the will of God. The question is, what is the will and work of God? And it is to believe in Christ alone. Okay. Uh, eternal life. And what is the way to eternal life? Well, Jesus told us the way to eternal life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In other words, the only way to heaven is doing the will of my Father. In John 12, 49, he said, I do not speak on my own accord. The Father who sent me, he commanded me what to say and how to say it, and I know that His command leads to eternal life. So Jesus is telling us, you want to enter life? Matthew 19, 16, obey God, obey the commandments of God. Thank you. So I, Mr. in the book of Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, it says, uh, when the wise men went to the house, they then saw Jesus, they saw the child, the mother Mary, they bowed down and worshipped him. If God is the only one to go worship, why did they worship Jesus? Okay, good question. Yeah. Yeah, the question is not about whether Jesus claimed to be God, but I will answer it's about whether Jesus received worship and why would he have received worship? Uh, I think that's what you're trying to ask. Why would Jesus receive worship? Well, if you go into the text, the word, the Greek word used for worship is proskyneo. And I will show you in the Bible in Matthew 18 26, a servant. Proskai kneels before his master. A servant falls down on his knees and bows before his master. So in the language of the Bible and in the cultures of the people of the Bible, people would bow down to each other as a symbol of respect. The Jews did this from long ago, thousands of years ago. The brothers of Joseph did the same thing to Joseph. But there's a problem. When the translators translate the word proskai neo, they, they translate it as worship only when it refers to Jesus. When the same proskyneo refers, proskyneo is the Greek word, when the same word, the original word is for, for worship, the same word is used for the servant bowing before his master in Matthew 18, 26. They translate it there not as worship, but as falling on your knees, so that people can be deceived into thinking that only Jesus was was, was worship, but actually they were bowing down for Jesus, just as the brothers of Joseph bowed down before Joseph, just as Abraham bowed down before the Hittites in the Old Testament, they did this practice as a symbol of, of, of respect, and the Bible is full of these examples. Yes, this is often done of Jesus, and as we look uh, before in uh, John 9, 38, we can see it in Mark 6, we can see it in Matthew, when Jesus does an amazing deed, and people fall on their face before God. Of course, when people attempted to do that in other cases, as we looked at in Acts 14, immediately they resisted this, tore their clothing, and said, we are men just like you, to somehow milk all of the divine language out of worship by saying, well, everyone bowed down before other people. Uh, that is not the case. They're worshiping, bowing down before Jesus to honor him as God. This is the last question. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk uh, about uh, he who never tells lies. He who says, I am coming, not empty and dead, but my reward with you. He who says, I am the first and the last. He who says, I am the beginning and the end. I would like to call to emphasize 
because the Bible says in the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 20, 20, chapter 1 John, chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible says that the true God is not Jesus. I would like God to emphasize. Just one more example of showing the deity of Christ. But remember, in this particular debate, we're only dealing with four of the 66 books. We would love as Christians to go to Colossians 1 and to go to Philippians and to go to 1 John and all of these New Testament passages that overtly express the deity of Christ. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Hebrews 1.8, 1, Titus 2.13. This passage in 1 John 5 is just one of the many examples that show the deity of Christ. But in fairness, this debate is about Jesus' claims uh, within the Gospels itself, but I do think that is a good point, that if we were outside of the four books of Scripture and went to the rest of the New Testament, it would just be a greater example of Jesus showing his deity. Well, uh, I would say that, uh, that there are many uh, verses, even outside the four Gospels, uh, which is in the Old Testament as well, as well as uh, many verses in the New Testament, which actually would prove also that Jesus is not God. But uh, that's obviously, like Paul mentioned, a topic for, for another debate. But uh, as, as far as we are concerned, we are concentrating on Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, because that's the, the Gospel uh, which is about Jesus' life and his ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, both speakers now have to have a few minutes to make a closing statement. Well, let me again thank all of those who have worked so hard to put this event together. And let me thank you, uh, the audience, for coming out tonight to hear our two perspectives on Jesus Christ. I have labored to show that Christ claims deity in many ways, including through his attributes, his titles, his works, and specifically, his teachings in the book of John. My opponent has proven ably that God the Father and God the Son are not the same person. And this is something that Christians have always believed. Abu has also told us that the Trinity and Jesus with two natures does not make sense. And yet he has failed to show us how this is contrary to reason and it is illogical. My question is, if Jesus, if God can do all things, why could he not have taken on another nature? Why could he not have taken on human flesh if God had wanted to? Why is this impossible? We are never told. In light of the words of Jesus in the Gospels and the rest of the biblical account, all of us should recognize, whether we, ex whether we accept the claims of Jesus or not, that Jesus, in fact, did claim to be God in human flesh, and that he was identical to the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. For the Christians here tonight, I want to encourage you to build friendships with the Muslims in your community. Abu is a friend of mine. His family are friends of ours. We are called by Jesus to love, and one of the ways that you can love is to know what they believe and share what you believe. As I look over the audience, I see many of my Muslim friends here tonight. And out of deep concern and love, I cannot end our debate without imploring you from one last sobering text from Scripture. Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am, ego eimi, the same name Yahweh, Jehovah God, only uses for himself in Isaiah 43 10 Exodus 4 unless you believe that I am who I say I am unless you believe that I am you 
will die in your sins. What Jesus demands from the world is that we believe in Jesus as he revealed himself in the scriptures. We believe in one God, but this one God has existed from eternity in three persons. And in the greatest expression of love the world has ever known, Jesus took on human nature, and in addition to his divine nature, lived a perfect life, and freely gives his life on the cross as a sacrifice for sin. Yes, Jesus is merciful, and yes, Jesus is forgiven. Yes, God is merciful, and God is forgiving, but God is also holy and just, and he must punish sin. Jesus took the guilt of sinners upon himself on the cross, and though Jesus lowered himself into the depths of humiliation, he ascended to the heights of glory at his resurrection. All those who turn away from their own merits and repent by trusting in Jesus Christ alone will receive eternal life. Let me encourage you to read the Bible on your own and study the claims of Jesus from the Gospels and elsewhere. And may God give you new eyes to see the truth. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think tonight was a dialogue where both Muslims and Christians would be able to learn from the discussions as well as be stimulated by the arguments presented by both the Christian and the Muslim panel. I would, however, reiterate and emphasize not my words, but the words of Christ himself who said in so many verses, and he said it to the devil in Matthew chapter 4 verse 10, Worship, God has written, or it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Dear friends, Paul has said that we should believe the words of Jesus. If you believe the words of Jesus, you will do what he said. By worshipping only the God that Jesus worshipped. Because Jesus said, worship him only. Serve him only. And this was his central mission. This was his central teaching. This is why he came to earth to teach man the oneness of God, to proclaim God's oneness and the worshipping of only one God. When the rich ruler, not the rich ruler, the, the Jewish teacher came to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12 verse 29 and he said to Jesus, he said to Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus said, the most important commandment is this, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He didn't say the Lord is three in one. He didn't say the Lord is two in one. He said the Lord is one. Jesus always, never ever equated himself with the Father. The Jews claim that and we have heard tonight many people saying that the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. That's true. But the reason they wanted to kill him is because he claimed to be the Messiah. Not because he claimed to be God. Yes, they told him that you claim to be God and then he corrected them. He corrected them in John chapter 10 verse 34 reading onwards. So dear friends, Jesus did not claim to be Almighty God. The Quran states in chapter 5 verse 116, that on the day of judgment, God will question every human being. And on that day, God will ask Jesus, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as gods besides the one God? And Jesus will say, Subhanak, 
Oh my Lord, how exalted are you? I would never say what I had no right to say. And certainly if you read the Gospels, we see Jesus saying these things. He is saying that do not call, or why do you call me good? There is none that is good save one. Jesus says to God on judgment day, I only said to them what you commanded me to say to them. And if you read the Bible, Jesus only spoke the commandment of God in John 12, 49. He says, it is the Father who commands me what to say and how to say it. So I only said to them what you commanded me to say to them, to worship the one God who is my Lord and your Lord. The Quran gives us the warning and says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ Those, those who say God is Jesus are blaspheming Almighty God. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ Christ himself said, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ O children of Israel, أُعْبُدُ اللَّهُ Worship the one God, رَبِّي وَرَبَّهُمْ Who is my Lord and your Lord. I will conclude with the verse of the Quran of chapter 2 verse 136 where God Almighty commands us to declare unto humanity and Allah says, God Almighty says, قُولُوا آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمِ Say to all of humanity, we believe in the one God and in the revelation sent down to us and in that sent to Abraham, to Ishmael, to Isaac, to Jacob, to the tribes and we believe in the revelations given to the prophets and we believe in that given to Jesus and Moses and we make no differences between any one of God's prophets and we surrender ourselves, submit ourselves to the will of only God, the, the God of Jesus, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses. Moses worshipped him, Abraham worshipped him, and the 55 prophets of the Old Testament all worshipped him. And they did not know him as three in one. They knew him as one and alone, and that's certainly who he was. I would like to thank you all, my dear brothers and sisters, and I would like to extend extend my, my heartfelt appreciation to all the Christians who are present here to, to, who are present here and I would like to say to you that this is a dialogue for us to learn from each other and to stimulate us to go forward and understand each other's beliefs in a better light. Thank you very much. The people who made it possible for us that's a form to hear for from being my, my, for, for providing us with this form. And then let me thank the two speakers, both of you. You, uh, you held this discussion on a high level and uh, on an exciting level. And we hope that the one and only true God will work through this and through his work in the heart of everyone here.